Just off the coast of Nova Scotia, Canada, the tragic crash of Swiss Air Flight 111 prompted one of the largest underwater recovery missions in history. Join the Sea Hunters as they probe the site and explore the remains of the mystery ship discovered during the hunt for the doomed jetliner. With over 100 million books in print, Clive Custler is the grand master of shipwreck tales and adventure. Director of the Vancouver Maritime Museum, James Delgado is one of the world's foremost marine archaeologists. With over 20 years wreck diving experience, Mike Fletcher is an internationally renowned professional diver. Leading the Econova dive team, John Davis has coordinated shipwreck searches around the globe. Together, they explore the planet's last frontier in search of true adventures, the famous shipwrecks. They are the Sea Hunters. On a warm summer night in 1998, Swiss Air Flight 111 fell from the sky into the North Atlantic. This tragic event triggered one of the largest and most extensive search and salvage efforts ever undertaken in the world's oceans. Before leaving the site, they would retrieve two million individual pieces, representing 98% of the aircraft. During this incredible search, a long cylindrical object was discovered on the seabed. Initially thought to be a section of the fuselage, it turned out to be unrelated to the aircraft and was of unknown origin. Now join us as we follow the investigation of this tragedy from the seafloor to the laboratory, while we also dive to uncover the secrets and identity of the mysterious object. At 10.14 p.m. on September the 2nd, 1998, Swiss Air Flight 111 was en route from New York to Geneva, Switzerland, when something went horribly wrong. The pilot reported smoke in the cockpit and requested permission for an emergency landing. Canadian Air Traffic Control recommended that he set course for Halifax, Nova Scotia, just 107 kilometers or 58 nautical miles away. Minutes later, as the plane jettisoned fuel in preparation for its descent, it suddenly disappeared from the radar screen. Flight 111, carrying 229 people, had fallen from the sky and plunged into the darkness of the sea. All along the coast of St. Margaret's Bay, residents were startled by the tremendous roar which shook their houses and echoed into the night. Fishermen took to their boats, hurrying through familiar waters to investigate. What they found floating on the choppy seas amid the overwhelming smell of jet fuel, they will never forget. Desperately, they began searching, hoping to find the living amidst an ocean of death. Before morning, a massive rescue was launched, coordinated by the Canadian Navy. Dozens of vessels, aircraft and helicopters, and hundreds of people began scouring St. Margaret's Bay looking for survivors, but finding only floating wreckage and victims. It soon became apparent that there would be no survivors. At this point, the mission became one of recovery. The Canadian Transportation Safety Board began their investigation into the cause of the disaster, an investigation which required the finding and retrieval of the aircraft's wreckage from the bottom of the sea. Months after the disaster, sea hunter John Davis answers a call from Gordon Fader, a marine geologist who had participated in the search. During the hunt for Flight 111 wreckage, Gordon's team discovered evidence of something else on the seabed, something which they were unable to identify. Here at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, he shows John images of the object, which appears to be long and cylindrical, Gordon would like the sea hunters to dive the site and take a look. <laughs> Aboard the Canadian Coast Guard vessel Hudson, sea hunters John Davis and Mike Fletcher joined Gordon Fader and the team's marine archaeologist James Delgado. 
The Hudson and her sonar equipment were part of the Flight 111 search fleet in 1998. Today, she'll return to the waters to hunt for the mysterious object. Once it has been found, a pod camera will be lowered, enabling the team to get a closer look. Gordon's records put the target at about eight kilometers, or 4.3 nautical miles south of Peggy's Cove. Okay, this is Peggy's Cove right here, right? At the time of the crash, in order to determine the cause of the disaster, investigators first had to locate the aircraft's remains on the ocean floor. There had been no eyewitnesses to the actual crash, so the direction of the search was determined by distilling several sources of information, such as the jet's last known radar position, the location of drifting debris, and even the reports of shore dwellers who saw or heard the jet scream over their houses. At last, a search pattern was drawn up and charted. A search area, which covered 100 square kilometers or 38 square miles of ocean. Search vessels, some equipped with side-scan sonar and others with the latest in multi-beam side-scan equipment, began a methodical task of sweeping the ocean floor. Computers transformed the data into accurate three-dimensional images of the ocean bottom. Then, at the edge of the search grid, the survey vessel made an exciting discovery, a hit. An object almost exactly the length of the missing airliner. During the actual search for Flight 111, the Navy found at the extreme edge of the search area a very promising target. They felt at that point that it could be part of the fuselage of the plane. When they lowered a drop camera down to the site, they noted immediately that the object was covered in rust. And since a modern aluminum aircraft wouldn't have any rust, the investigators knew immediately that this was not part of the wreckage of Flight 111. They returned to another area of the search and they never went back. What we would like to accomplish is to return to that site to get some side-scan sonar images of the object and to get a drop camera down in an attempt to make a final identification. On the way to the site, Gordon and the team review the bottom profile reading from the original Swiss Air search. Well, there's the two high points. You're uh, almost on them. Right here is the first high point. And the reason why you see this, I think this is just side echo up. The ship is sitting in the middle, but the system is it's proud and heard. And what's happening, the reflection's coming off of that, so it's, you're getting this side echo off of it. And then, of course, uh, this is your other burn top up here. So it's just right. a small little feature. Once the Hudson has arrived at the site, the side scan is lowered and the sweeping begins. The side scan sonar follows the Hudson at the end of a tow cable. The Hudson then begins the methodical tracing of the search area. The search area, in this case, is small thanks to Gordon's accurate records of the target's position. Below decks, everyone waits for the data to come in. Is that debris there, Gordon? Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's bad rock. That, that little piece might be debris. Yeah, I'm working on it. Yeah. Nothing on the side scan readings escapes Gordon's notice. And there it is. A long, rigid slash seems to jump off the sheet. Yeah, it is easy to understand how those searching for Flight 111 might have mistaken it for an aircraft. There even seems to be a perpendicular structure resembling a wing. But if it's not an aircraft, then what is it? That's big, isn't it? 300 feet, yeah. The team is certain that the pod camera will provide an answer. Side-scan sonar is a wonderful tool for searching for, and in some cases, identifying shipwrecks. But side-scan is at best a very limited image. You may get a shape that looks like a ship or a submarine, but it can just be rocks or some other type of debris. The best way to look at it is to either send an ROV down, or send a drop camera, or to send a diver. In the case of the Swiss Air disaster in 1998, when the surveyors went over what they presumed was the wreck site, they realized they'd have to send divers down. And when they sent those divers down, what they saw on the bottom 
with scattered pieces of the aircraft. When the aircraft had been located, the next phase of the operation began, recovery of the wreck. The recovery operation was to become one of the largest and most extensive in history. Over two million pieces of the jet were recovered, amounting to an amazing 98% of the structure. The operation involved divers climbing amidst razor-sharp shards of wreckage and especially equipped recovery vessels, such as the U.S. Navy's Grapple and the dredging ship Queen of the Netherlands. Larry Vance of the National Transportation Safety Board. This is the biggest investigation that we've ever undertaken. Certainly we've never had this extent of recovery uh, underwater from an underwater op uh, perspective before. We were looking at a depth of water in and around 185, 190 feet, and it's quite difficult for divers to work for any great length of time at that water depth. What we were looking at initially was trying to get um, the pile of debris defined, see what we had, take a lot of uh, photographs and video with ROVs and with divers and so on to see what we were dealing with. Then we had to get a plan together so that we could attack this pile of wreckage and, and put together our recovery plan, of course, keeping in mind that we had the, uh, the victims in the, uh, in the wreckage and we had to do whatever we could to try and, uh, and uh, look after that element. So it, it was a challenge. This challenge, the painstaking recovery of the wreckage from the ocean floor, required over 15 months hard work and an expenditure that exceeded $50 million. With the recovery complete, the investigation into the cause of the crash was only beginning. Now that the Hudson had arrived at the mystery coordinates as logged by the Navy, the first step in the Sea Hunter's quest is to gather video images of the object. The crew of the Hudson prepare to lower an underwater camera system called a cam pod. This sturdy unit is built around a downward angled submersible camera and a powerful array of lights. It is lowered to the mystery object 54 meters, or almost 180 feet below. Unlike an ROV, which is self-propelled, the camera pod has no propulsion. It simply dangles over the target, swinging at the end of its cable. It will provide the team with little more than a peephole into the depths. Hopefully, that will be enough to identify the mystery object. Because the wreck is only a few miles offshore, these visiting scientists and oceanography students can share the experience of seeing the first images of this target. The video images snake topside through the cam pod's umbilical. First, they're murky and unclear. But gradual details emerge. A hatch, a rail. The images are both sharp and frustratingly limited. Details come in and out of focus. The inability to steer the pod to maneuver it over the salient features makes this task surprisingly difficult. With such limited visibility, looks can be deceiving. I saw that, and I'm starting to think it's like it almost looks like a tank or pontoon. But well, we're just not seeing enough, you know. It's the blind man in the dark trying to Definitely had a hand valve. You can see the. I was out of valve. Yeah, but you'd, but you'd have valves on subs too. We're just not seeing enough yet. One of the most frustrating things in looking through a camera is having a very limited field of vision. You don't have that sense of three-dimensional vision that you ordinarily do when you're out there in the rest of the world. On the bottom, it's hemmed, it's closed in a bit by being underwater, particularly if it's dark. All you've got is that screen ahead of you, and you're looking at the world in small pieces as it exists down there on the bottom. And yet, you have to create a visual map in your mind that literally takes all those pieces of the puzzle and to try to assemble them in your head to come up with a comprehensive understanding of what you're looking at. That's a very difficult thing to do, and it's mentally exhausting. Yet on occasion, you can get enough information 
to say with some definition, yes, this is this or this is that. But in many cases, it's still not quite enough and you need to send a diver. Is that a fix? Yeah. Peering into the darkness, the team pour over the images, looking for that one detail that will provide an identification. Hatch. It's an open hatch. That's, that's a submarine hatch. It's supposed to flip down. See the hatch? As the footage came back, and as I looked at it on the monitor, it certainly looked like it could be a submarine. But what type of submarine? How old? And how did it come to rest on the bottom? One of the big questions was whether or not we were looking at a German U-boat that had been lost in a late war depth charge attack. But it could have been something else. That meant we had to go down. We had to look at it on the bottom. And this thing's on its side. Look at that light up there. Yeah. That? It almost looks like it's made out of aluminum. It's so shiny. No, 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 no. Look no, at that no, deck. No, that's, that could be some form of there's, superstructure. There's that same spot again. Remember? Look at that. See that? Is that a ventilator? Look at that right there. Right there. Is that a ventilator? Right there. It almost looks like the screen on a uh, on a sea chest. Yeah. There's a hatch. hatch. There's a hatch. But there's no mechanism to open. Okay, but look, look, see that? See how it? That was a hatch. This is looking like submarine. Is that a fix? Yeah. yeah. Submarine of some sort. Yeah. Think so? Yeah. That's it. So. That's it. Oh, well, the mystery continues. Oh, that's it. Nicely done. Good. Night. Now the team is faced with a new challenge, the identification of the mystery submarine. Could it have sunk secretly while on some clandestine mission? Germany's wolf pack prowled these waters during the Second World War. Could this be an undiscovered U-boat? The team determines that the only way to identify the sub conclusively is to put someone down on it. While Mike Fletcher prepares to dive the wreck, James Delgado will continue with his research. Together, they will gather the evidence needed to determine whether this boat is friend or foe. When all evidence of the Swiss air tragedy was recovered, it was shipped to the Shearwater Air Force Base, a short distance from the crash site. Here, each piece was cataloged identified and studied for clues to the cause of the crash. At the Transportation Safety Board, we're charged with looking at aircraft accidents and trying to find out what happened and why, and in particular, find out if there are any safety deficiencies associated with what we're looking at from an accident scenario. When we go to investigate accidents, the most important elements that we have to work with are the data recorders that are on board the aircraft, and then the wreckage that we have, so that we can look through the wreckage and see if we can find evidence of what might have happened and why it happened. The main focus of this process was the cockpit, where the fire seems to have started. This section of the aircraft was reconstructed on this specially built framework, or jig. We put together the portions of the aircraft that we felt were important from the front section of the aircraft. Um, and. Uh, we did, we did some work in putting together the, for example, the, some of the skin of the airplane and so on to give us our, our shape and, uh, and so on so we could try and find the parameters of the, uh, of the fire. After examining the reconstruction, investigators learned that the fire had extended well beyond the cockpit. It basically replicates the front end of the airplane dimensionally exactly so that we were able to take the station numbers of the different pieces and put them where they belonged. And you can see here, this is an example, for example, of, of the fracture matching that we're talking about on the smaller pieces. You can see it here, where you match this piece and this piece together, and this piece and this piece together. And uh, there, in fact, there are some unique patterns in, uh, in, uh, in the aircraft because of the particular shape of it that you can measure, for example, the distance between these holes here. And uh, that's going to tell you where that piece belongs. Okay. Because it's the only place on the whole airplane where those holes are like that. So, this, this is the sort of thing that you do in accident investigation, is, is take all this information and put it together. What the crash investigators were doing with the Swiss air wreck was the exact opposite of what we were planning to do with the mystery wreck. By sending Mike down to collect information, gather photographs and images of a broken, but still largely intact hull, we could hopefully reassemble just what type of ship this was and how it had been lost. 
without having to raise a single item to the surface. Descending almost 180 feet, or 54 meters, Mike approaches the mystery wreck. It should be the wreck. Auto pressure set at 185, over. Roger that. You should see the wreck. I see the wreck, right bottom, okay. Roger, on bottom now. One of the most exciting things in shipwreck work is finding a ship that's never been traced or identified before. In the case of the mystery wreck lying off Peggy's Cove, what we weren't sure of was whether or not it was a wrecked submarine. If it was a submarine, what it was doing there and how it ended up on the bottom were questions we hoped to answer. Was it an unreported sinking of a World War II German U-boat? If so, why had it never been reported? Those questions led us not only to the bottom, but into the archives. Okay, the uh, collapsed on the port side, and looking up, you can see what would be the gun turret, the access gun turret tower, and that should be the uh, the conning tower access right there. Roger, we got a good picture. The use of traditional commercial dive equipment is ideal for this sort of investigative diving. The camera mounted on the side of the helmet allows me to interact with the surface crew. And because we're in constant voice communication, they can guide me around the site. Essentially, I become their hands and eyes on the bottom of the sea. Once enclosed by plate steel, the three hatchways of the conning tower stand exposed. The three vertical structures we had seen in the side scan were obvious. The other thing that was obvious is that this was definitely a submarine. But what classification? From what era? Those structures were going to help Jim answer those questions. As Mike moved over the wreck, there were features that immediately came into the viewfinder. Features that looked to me to be a submarine that couldn't have been built during the Second World War. It looked much earlier. The dive planes, the construction of the stern, the shape of the hull, and then, as Mike went farther forward, the conning tower itself, detached from the hull and lying on its side, looked very similar to post-World War I submarines. I had a very clear sense that we were not looking at a German U-boat. What we were looking at was a British submarine built after the First World War. I'll swim towards the stern now, to the uh, sub here. You can see how the hull has the taper, and then there's two wings. When Mike dropped on down to the bottom, and he began moving forward, we found he'd come right down on the stern. And one of the first things he found were these huge shark-shaped fins sweeping off from one side to the other. That's a particular feature of earlier submarines. That's not something you see in a World War II sub. And the moment I looked at those, I knew we were looking at a submarine from the early 20th century. Going back into the archives later, I was able to match the same shape to drawings and photographs of British L-class submarines Jim's findings echo a claim made by local historian and author David Perkins. And uh, give me a bottom time here. Roger, we have a bottom time of 15 minutes. At the stern of the wreck, Mike sees the propellers of what we now know is an L-class submarine. As he moves from the stern, Mike spies an open hatch. He makes the decision to go inside and search for clues to its identity. During the First World War, the submarine evolved from a primitive, untried novelty into a strategic weapon 
which very nearly won the war for Germany. Spurred by the successes of Germany's U-boat fleet, Britain's Royal Navy attempted to create an effective long-range submarine. The L-Class was the successful result. The L-Class boats offered their crews better armament, greater safety, and a more hospitable living environment than earlier British designs. Most of the vessels were finished too late to see combat in the First World War. Instead, they served as the backbone of the British submarine fleet during the 1920s, patrolling the waters of the British Empire from the English Channel to the China Sea. One L-Class boat, L-55, was lost in the Baltic during intervention in the Russian Civil War. The Soviet Navy subsequently raised and operated the submarine, borrowing many of its design features for their own fleet. An interesting feature of the class was the installation of torpedo tubes in the nose and in the beam, the last British design to incorporate this broadside ability. She also sported a gun on the bridge, enabling the gun crew access to the gun before the sub was fully surfaced. Through careful research and keeping in mind the local submarine historian's suggestion, James Delgado narrows the list of L-class candidates down to a few. At the outbreak of World War II, only three of these submarines remained in service, the L-23, 26, and 27. Mike finds the torpedo bay. Roger. Roger. I'm uh, turning to go back out. Up on the diver. Roger that. We're coming up over. Roger that. Coming out. I'm through the uh, bulkhead doorway. Moving aft towards the open hatch. Diving the North Atlantic in 180 feet or 54 meters of water is one thing, but diving inside a submarine on the bottom of the sea at that depth does pose its own special problems. In this case, access to the torpedo bay was relatively unrestricted. And I had peace of mind knowing that I had an endless supply of helium and oxygen for me to breathe being pumped down from the surface to my helmet. If there was a problem, John and Jim would be the first to know. So I was right to feel confident. We had the right crew, we had good equipment. This was a totally unexplored shipwreck. Everything was set. Some days, you just got to go for it. Mike continues to gather images of the submarine's exterior. OK, looking down inside the uh, awning tower, you can see the stairs leading down into the tower but you can't see an open hatch, or closed hatch for that matter. To be able to literally see from one end of the submarine to the other really was a rare occasion. It gave me a sense of scale. This really was a huge submarine. And the other thing that struck me was how deeply it was embedded into the rocky bottom. Mike heads aft where he believes he may find another open hatch. Sure enough, there's another entry into the wreck.
The open hatch into what would have been the engine room really presented an excellent opportunity to get inside and see that diagnostic equipment that I knew would help Jim identify this vessel. And even though it seemed risky, I really felt it was important to get inside. Okay, I'm uh, attempting to go in. Understood. Your picture. Good picture. Can you pan down there a little, please. Hey, I'm going through this open doorway. Leading aft. I'm through that doorway now. How's your picture? We have good picture there. There's some sort of a dinner plate. Okay, that's center there, Mike. It's trying hard not to stir things up, but it's uh, very close quarters in here. back out of this open hatchway or doorway and move forward. Okay, that's pretty much destroyed all the visibility in here. How's your picture? I have, uh, 60%. Roger that. I'll move forward, see if we can get into an area where the water is a bit clearer. There, that's better. I'm moving forward. What would be the starboard side of uh, one of the main main engines? This is a link to these rusticles in here, hanging down from the ceiling or the upper deck. There, 18 inches long. How's your picture? That's a great picture, Mike. Okay. Moving forward again. Well, my feeling is I am between the two engines. So, this would be the starboard engine on that side, port engine on that side, moving forward. Okay, and you can just see the voice pipe between the two engines. When Mike's on the bottom, we're working as a team. I'm up on the surface looking into the monitor as he makes the dive. And so, step by step, 
I'm there with him, literally looking over his shoulder. I have the opportunity to review plans, to look at drawings and photographs. And so, as Mike worked through that wreck, the features that identified it as an early British submarine were very clear. The submarine was L-26, brought out to Canada during the Second World War to help the Canadian Navy. That submarine had ultimately ended her days as a target ship for the Royal Canadian Navy to train sonar operators in the locating and in the killing of German U-boats. By the closing months of the Second World War, the Canadian Navy had expanded from over 3,000 officers and men to a powerful fighting force of nearly 100,000 men and women. Yet despite its success in shepherding hundreds of convoys across the Atlantic, it remained frustratingly inept at hunting and killing German submarines. To acquire sub-hunting skills, Canadian sailors and airmen needed to train with real submarines. After years of petitions from the Canadian Admiralty, the Royal Navy finally agreed to give Canada some surplus subs, including L-26. In 1944, L-26 served almost constantly as a practice target in the waters of Nova Scotia and Bermuda. Six days a week, she and her crew were constantly tracked, pinged, and attacked by Canadian warships and aircraft. Even though the attacks were feigned, the constant game of hide and seek must have been exhausting for the men. For much of 1944, L-26 labored in the training of Canadian sailors in the fine points of anti-submarine warfare. But by December of 1944, she was definitely showing her age. Her sea time was limited by the constant maintenance she required. The decision was made to pay her off and remove her from active service. A few months later, with the war won and the world finally at peace, the L-26 was towed out to sea, her sea cocks were opened, and she slipped beneath 54 meters or 180 feet of water. There, hidden in the depths, she served as a static target for trainee sonar operations. But by the 1950s, sonar technology had improved to the extent that such drills were no longer useful. And so the Navy and the world slowly forgot about L-26 and the yeoman-like service she had provided to the Commonwealth in peacetime and in war. Diving on the wreck of L-26 and identifying the ship was relatively easy from an archaeological standpoint because we had a largely intact vessel to deal with. It was a very different case, though, for the investigators working on the Swiss Air 111 crash. More than two million pieces of that aircraft lay on the bottom, marking where 229 people had died, and finding as many of those pieces as possible to figure out what had happened was a daunting task that took far more time than it took for us to determine just what L-26 was. This, this one area here represents one, two, three, four, five, six. That's, those are six pieces, seven, that uh, were, were put back together. One of the things that makes this investigation unique is, is the circumstance of the, of the scenario. We have a, a huge airplane, a complex airplane with complex systems in it. We put a fire on board that airplane, and then we take that airplane and plunge it into the ocean and have it break into two million pieces. And of course, when it hits the surface of the ocean, it puts the fire out. If this aircraft had crashed on the ground, there would have been, of course, a huge ground fire, and the ground fire would have obscured much of the information that we're working with to find out what happened and why. We have an opportunity in this particular investigation to look at a fire in flight, if you will, captured in time. Larry, what do we have here? What is this particular collection of wreckage? This is one of the circuit breaker panels from the in the cockpit area of the aircraft, and it's one of the uh, one of the the many 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 reconstruction projects that we had over the last three years 
to, uh, to take these circuit breaker panels and put them back into some shape so we could have a, uh, um, an opportunity to look and see how the fire was affecting uh, the airplane in this area. Now I see pieces on here, and I'll just point, uh, right. that are no bigger than the end of my little finger. Are, these, are those indicative of the size of pieces that you were taking off the bottom? Absolutely. These are some of the more important pieces that we took off the bottom uh, to tell us uh, uh, more about the environment that was happening inside the airplane. If you look at these, these little circuit breakers here, you can see that they have a white ring around them that shows when the circuit breaker is in fact popped. And we found some circuit breakers and uh, we're using that information. For example, that would have this white, white ring part with, uh, with soot on it which would indicate that that circuit breaker was popped in and being uh, influenced by the fire environment before the aircraft hit the water. You know, it's, a, it's an incredible job to think that you can find all of these pieces, put them back together like this, put them on this plexiglass, and then read what they mean from an investigation perspective. The clues which could solve the mystery of this tragedy may be found in a single tiny piece of wreckage. The fact that such tiny pieces are available to the investigators is a credit to the dedication of the countless men and women involved in the recovery effort. The divers and the air crash investigators on Swiss Air 111 had to be patient because they had to sort through an incredible amount of material on the bottom under trying circumstances with depth and time working against them. For Mike, inside that sub, we were also facing the same issues. We'd succeeded in identifying the wreck but now, Mike faced some real pressure, getting safely out of the wreck and back to the surface. That's not easy, deep inside a corroding submarine left over from World War II. Damn, uh, my hose is hung up, so I can't go forward beyond here. I'm gonna have to go back to the uh, opening of the hatch and clear my hose. Mike's umbilical is fetched up. He can't go any farther. He has penetrated a total of 60 feet, or 20 meters, into the sub. Would you like us to pick up on the umbilical, Mike? Now, let me get uh, back to the hatch, make sure the, the umbilical's not hung up. Mike slowly makes his way back to the hatch. His next challenge is to get safely out of the submarine. I want to be sure that it's not caught here. Oh, yep, the diver is umbilical. I'm here at the uh, hatch opening. Up on my hose. Roger, coming up on your hose. Okay, I'm gonna push my hose out and uh, just chase it out. Roger, give me an all stop. Roger that. With a safety tank, his helmet equipment, and the coiled up umbilical. It's no small accomplishment just getting out of the sub. Let me go through the hatch now. As dives go, this really was a great adventure. You seldom get a situation where everything comes together and the wreck slowly reveals itself to you. This was one of those rare events. The positive identification of submarine L-26, 56 years after her sinking, 
is extremely satisfying for the sea hunters. As Mike presents Gordon Fader with his footage of the wreck, Gordon has one further request. As part of his study on the effects of the dredging that took place during the recovery effort, he has asked the team to dive and gather video images of the seabed at the Flight 111 crash site. As they had promised Gordon Fader, the Sea Hunters returned to Ground Zero, to the site of the Swiss Air Flight 111 disaster, to videotape the seabed. In the aftermath of the Swiss Air 111 crash investigation, the wreck site was dredged to remove traces of the aircraft and to make sure that every conceivable part had been recovered. That enabled the investigators to reassemble much of the aircraft and to point to the cause of the disaster. And yet, a year later, when Mike Fletcher dived to see how the sea bottom had recovered at the site of Swiss Air 111, we were all startled to find small pieces of the aircraft still visible. It's a reminder that the sea has the power to hold, seemingly forever, nearly everything that it swallows. Amazingly enough, even in close proximity to our own shore, so many things rest on the bottom, so many things are forgotten, locked away in the depths of what sailors once called Davy Jones' locker. We still don't know everything that's down there, and we may never be able to search all the depths of the sea. It takes something like another sinking or a disaster like Swiss Air 111 to focus attention on the ocean's floor. And often what we find are long lost ships like L-26 stepping out of the pages of history. And now once again brought into the limelight because of the effort to resolve the mystery of yet another tragedy. All of this points to the fact that the ocean is a repository of the past. It's a reminder that the ocean remains not only the greatest museum mankind has ever known, it's also our greatest graveyard. And now it's your turn to get up off that couch and go into the mountains, go into the deserts, go into the lakes, the rivers, and the seas, and search for history. You'll never have a more rewarding adventure. Join us again as we search the oceans of the world for lost and famous shipwrecks. Another true adventure with The Sea Hunters.